Hey, it's Matt. Welcome to Rebel 73. Uh, we're reviewing, reviewing and discussing Shogun 2024, Episode 6. Okay, so I have refrained myself from talking a little more in depth about what's going on in the novel, what's going on in the movie, and the history. You know, I just kind of discuss some things, just because it kind of spoilers stuff. But, I don't know, with this episode... Uh, Okay, so full-on spoilers from here out, right? I mean, not just for the miniseries, the book, because there's a lot of context that's missing in this episode. So, which... And they've changed some things from the book, which which has inhibited... Uh, which I think is going to inhibit... Um, well, it's still not going to make it bad, but there's elements missing, okay? So, let's... let's so, you... What I think is missing is the context, and what what they're not putting in this in this adaptation, is the the broader context of what's going on in Japan at the time. Okay, so the period that begins when uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, who is the real life character Naga is based on, takes over Japan, becomes shogun, is the Tokugawa shogunate. All right, and that's called the Edo period. Okay. So I have a link below to the ranks, uh, to the feudal society ranks in Japan of the Edo of the of Edo era society, right? Now, that's the end of a period in Japan that, for all practical purposes, we call the Hundred Years War of Japan, even though it's not really that's not the name of it, okay? And I bel- I don't remember the name of it, but I do have the link to the character that's mentioned, uh, the Taiko, who that boy. Uh, so the Taiko, the real life Taiko is Toyotami Hideyoshi, okay? And what he did was he unified Japan. Um, he don't start a war in Korea, which was successful, but then eventually not. And they don't, they don't, again, I'm not going to go into the whole history of it. But the point is, he was essentially the, the ruling daimyo of Japan. Um, <clears throat> and the the the... I, he was shogun all but name is the best way to put it, right? So that, that you keep that in perspective. So now, and, and obviously, I've talked about how in, this is compressing events. How Mariko died before uh, the real life Mariko uh, died before the real life Blackthorn ever met her, and how her dying actually was a key event in uh, in drawing Ishido, the real life Ishida, it's Ishido in. In, in, the, in, the, in the Shogun uh, drawing him out of the Osaka allowing uh, to, uh, Ayesu, Ayesu Togawa to actually be able to win without dying on the walls of Osaka Castle okay um, <clears throat> so there's like I said a lot of you know complicated sort of stuff right uh, so there's that, that we got that in perspective right so the, the ch- the child, the the son of the Taiko, the is will be the rule would be the ruling military leader of Japan, assuming well what happens in real life and this novel doesn't happen, okay, um, and the council of regents were the five five uh, the five most powerful well five of the most powerful warlords under the Taiko, and they weren't chosen because they were all utterly loyal, okay. They were chosen because they, 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 there was rivalry between them, which um, the Taiko, both in the novel and in real life, Totoyama Hiradoshi, which kind of a variation on, on what happened with the regents, uh, knew would play off politically. Okay, Now in the novel, Tornaga is the, the one guy who's loyal to the Taiko. Okay? And it's they're emphasizing it very much so in this adaptation, he does not want to be Shogun. He knows if he conquers, if he wins this war with the Crimson Sky Plan, he's going to become Shogun. Now, what what's missing in all of this, okay? The Japanese Emperor and the Nobility. Well, by this time in Japan, the Emperor and the Nobility were long since basically figureheads and economic powers, but they, the Samurai caste had actually taken over Japan at this point, okay? So, uh, you know, the, the, basically... The imperial court and the nobles um, were figureheads and 
that would provide advice and had economic power, but they and they had uh, spiritual power, right? But um, they were not political power. The samurai caste basically ruled Japan. Okay, so that's kind of the perspective of what's going on there, right? Now that's the sort of conflict that's playing out that Tornaga is trying to navigate his way through. Okay, and uh, another thing to understand is. One of Tornaga's key things, which we've seen a little bit of, is he has eyes and ears everywhere, okay? So you'll see him constantly getting little notes. It's not always from that one guy who was a spy. Um, that, that scene's supposed to tell you that Tornaga has a vast intelligence network that he's put out there that is giving him information from everywhere, okay? So there's that, right? And the, 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 this adaptation has also... I have a feeling... Okay, so in the novels, in the sequence of the novels, right, uh, in the novel and the original adaptation, um, Blackthorn had already be begun to respect, admire, and integrate himself into Japanese culture at this point. He's still struggling with that here. He's sort of casually getting into it, but he's not. But by this point in the novel, and I mean the point where he becomes a samurai, right, which is what happens after he saves Toronaga's life, okay, um, it is. He had well. He had well since gained the respect respect for Japanese culture and mentally begun to assimilate. And after the, the original saving of Tornaga's life, what becomes Hatamoto, um, he spends time in the Japanese village uh, with the province where he, where he learns more Japanese. And eventually, it comes down to uh, this whole uh, him will basically attempting to commit seppuku, okay, and he's going to do it. I mean, the novel and the, the original adaptation, he. He does it. He's about to plunge a knife into his gut. And I, I believe it's Yabu or Omi, one of the two, who stops it. I, I'm pretty sure it's Yabu because the, there's a significant event that happens because of that. Yabu gains profound respect for him by that he sees it. He is he samurai in his heart, in a sense. And that happens before the um, uh, Blackthorn saving Tornaga from the earthquake. And they also pl played that different thing. I talked about it where Blackthorn was one of the few initially was all in on save, trying to save him, they all thought, a lot of, most of them thought Tornago was dead, okay? And they would begin to lament that they were all going to die now because of that, okay? So, and then, of course, the thing with the swords. So, Japanese, uh, Blackthorn's progress into the Japanese culture and becoming a vassal of of Tornaga had more or less completed um, by the time we get to the episode six where we are now, okay? In terms of the overall story. And... So that's obviously the difference with this adaptation. Not bad, I'm just explaining it. Because I think, without knowing something of what's going on in the background, you're not seeing the context of some of the things that Tornaga is doing, right? And I'm hoping that next episode, um, you get more... Because the, the, they've, like, they've told some aspects about Lady Ochiba's backstory and, and uh, Maracle's backstory through flashbacks, okay? And kind of, okay, that's fine. I'm not going to crazy about it. I'm not a big flashback fan, but whatever. Um, so, now the other thing I, I have some comments uh, uh, links for are about the Willow world, as mentioned in here. Okay? So I have links below to what something called Yukaku, to Oiran, uh, and Geisha. Okay? So, obviously it's the issue of prostitution in, in pre-modern Japan. Prostitution was finally outlawed in Japan in like the 1950s, okay, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, and we're not talking common prostitution per se, like 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 street level. We're talking like like uh, high class, high priced type of what we would call escorts, you know, in a modern world. Uh, and so, a geisha. So what happened was this. Courtesans, which was a more parent term you will have for it, developed over time in Japan, just like they did with courtesans in Europe too. It was just structured differently, okay? And they were, uh, I guess you would say, cultured prostitutes. They would do the sex work, but they would also often have specialties in maybe poetry, just some poetry, or, or play music, or acting, all sorts of stuff. And it wasn't just uh, women. It was men and women. And in Japan, they serviced men and women in the nobility. Because among the nobles, they could do whatever the hell they want. Okay, uh, and then over time that evolved into several different strains. For instance, uh, the role, the role of what we call a geisha became a non-sex worker, 
meaning there was no sex work involved anymore. It was all entertainment, all social entertainment for the wealthy, so and, and the nobles and the wealthy, right? Uh, and whereas Oiran, which are the basically prostitutes, uh, maintained the, they still maintained the the cultural elements the geisha had, but maintained the sex worker part, right? And in the modern Japan, uh, geisha still exists in their function, and even though prostitution was outlawed, or Oiran schools that were told no more sex work, but you can maintain your geisha like. Uh, Role and in fact were declared to be subsets of, of the geisha under law. Okay, so that's kind of and uh, yukaku is, and the reason I put that term because under Tokugawa Ieyasu, that's when these compound these prostitution was was isolated to these communities. So he basically took the structure where like Black Thorn went to the Willow World, which is isolated area of prostitution, is a sort of separate village from the village. And formalize that as a structure in Japan for prostitution. Okay, so that's kind of a lot of the context. There's a lot more. I mean, you know, it's a, it's it's, you know, like any great novel with a lot of depth, whether it's Lord of the Rings or Dune or you know Shogun, you can only adapt so much before it becomes you know just a text scroll across the screen with the actors reading the lines of their characters, right? So I get that, and I'm not complying. I still love this adaptation. It's still great. No problems there. Um, I just think it's a little, the last two episodes, what's the, what exactly is going on with Toranaga, um, the complex relationship between the daimyos, between the Christian and non-Christian ones, um, the value of Black, they've, they've under, they've undersold Blackthorn by quite a bit in this series, okay? Um, not, I mean, and I'm not saying there's a wokeism to that, I'm just saying maybe this, this showrunner doesn't think that the level of like like he's he is more at the level that the real life character is uh, a personality was in terms of accomplishments and effect than the than the character Blackthorn in the novel, um, which is probably ultimately why I will, I will prefer the original adaptation to this because in a sense as true to who Blackthorn was in the novel than this is going to be okay, oh, so th- so there's that oh, so I, I can yabber yabber jibber jabber for more if I want to but let's let's do my walk through the episode. So this is a flashback. So this is one uh that's uh young Mariko and young Ruri who became Lady Ochiba. And that's Mariko's father, okay. So this is a somewhat change from the novel in a sense like there's gonna be a reveal here in this episode that Mariko's father had her marry B- Buntaro to get her as far away from him as, as his family as possible before, um, before what do you call it? Before he did what he, he did his act of assassination, which would get had his whole family be, have to be killed or kill themselves. Okay, so she was protected because she was no longer in his family. She was in the Toda family under a different daimyo, him Hiramatsu. Okay, and. I'm not again. I don't want to real world versus adaptation versus novel. I don't want to get into all that. Okay, but I think the slight way they've changed it here makes it a little more difficult to kind of understand. Not so much what Maracle is doing. Our character arc is fairly clear in the now in, in in this adaptation. I think the one area where I hope to do a lot of work next episode for this is that complex military and political situation. Because now now we're at the the dawn of Crimson Sky, right? Which is uh, uh, which is Tornaga's plan to, to plan, so to speak, and hopefully next episode will will we'll convey a lot more of the political information and so forth. Okay. So this so this thief, yeah, this is him. The reward, a samurai become samurai, blah blah blah, yeah. So th- this lead, you know, Yabu is still trying to play both sides, um, and Tornaga knows it. 
And since Buntero humanizing himself, you know, Buntero is a, comp a complicated character after showing it here. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, there wasn't enough Yabu in this episode. Don't worry, people. He comes back big time. So here's the arrog the arrogance of uh, of Bontaro, which he doesn't understand. Okay, so to make this clear, Marico is alive because Tornaga wants her alive. He needs her. Okay, um, he is following along the path of vengeance for his friend Akemi Jinsai. Okay, um, there's a whole sequence to that that's back behind the scenes. He, Buntaro's value to him is that Buntaro is the son of his right man, right hand man, General Hiramatsu, Hiramatsu, and also he is a brave warrior, a, a warrior, and his marriage to Mariko lets Mar Mariko's life be preserved because he's in the Toda family. But Buntaro's value is not inherited to himself; it's who he's the son of and who he's married to. Okay, because um, his elite level warrior him is nice. But he's not a big thinker, okay? And Tornaga is manipulating them to be together. Um, so this is Hiramatsu escaping. So now that's another thing. They, they kind of, they do allude to a bit here. There are a lot of hostages in Osaka Castle, okay? Ishida has a lot. And that's going to become a big plot element, I think, in the next episode, okay? Um, as to why this war hasn't broke out is because of all those hostages that Ishida has assumed in uh, Osaka Castle. They haven't had as much with the church. Uh, there was more. There's more in the novel and the representation with the church, uh, the church's actions in all this. Um... So, uh, there, there, there haven't been as much. Maybe in the last couple episodes, episodes there will be. So now we learn that Ruri is the son, the daughter of the person that uh, Mariko's father assassinated. Okay, and she blames Tornaga, of course, uh, of course, because he was. There's a whole again the whole political backstory. This is the, the no play, which is, which is a big, obviously a big Japanese art form. There's quite a few of them out there that are, that are amazing. You can go check out on YouTube. And by the way, if, you, if you're wondering, would it be normal for a, a daimyo level uh, to be a no performer? Yes, because the upper classes in Japan, even samurai upper classes, art and acculturation was considered part of their training. And this is basically uh, uh, the advisor there telling Lady Ochiba that if she wants peace and her son to, to rule, Tornaga's the guy. Because Ashido will backstab her, uh, only, her, only her son to live so long as it's useful to consolidate his power. That's the, ta the Taiko. And here's his the Willow World scenes. Now, in the novel, there's an earlier scene uh, in there with a Yabu going there, which, which I think had they included, it would have involved for a lot less setup needed for the audience and would have simplified that dialogue a bit. And this is this is when the count. Uh, oh, it's somewhere in here. Leo Shiba continues to 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 manipulate 
uh, event to try to get her revenge. This is Hiromatsu and he's trying to take his family and fight his way out of the castle. Yoshido kills the, the guy, the region who disagrees with him. Basically, the beginning of the manipulations. And Crimson Krim, Sky gets declared. So, all in all, straightforward. Um, I like the presentation. I, do, I, I wish they had more. They would do more with what Toranaga is thinking. Put some more dialogue in there because it's an amazing role in the book. Um, Sonata's doing a great job playing the character. And, uh, you know, I, I just think the political, I just think it's muddy right now, the, the political situation, the military situation. I think to the viewer watching this, it might be a little muddy. Um, but we'll see if they clear. The point was this is not this is a ten episode mini series, so it's a movie in ten parts, right? So if the next part clears up a lot of it, then that's perfectly fine infrastructure. That's why I'm not downgrading this episode to like a five or whatever. It's still a great episode because the way they because it's a mini series uh, meant to be viewed as a 10, 10 hour movie basically. Um, they can include more in depth. I, I think. If they do what the part of the book adaptation next, which is Mariko and Blackthorn uh, are leading a contingency to go to Osaka, because Blackthorn has to sell the ship there, um, to get the hostages out, and leading to the sequence of events that occur there, right? Yabu goes with them, by the way. Um, and, and that's where Yabu chooses sides, I guess I'll put it that way. And if they do that in the next episode... I think that will go a long way to putting the political situation into context. And maybe on a rewatch, now knowing that, like, you'll understand more. That's the most, there's a, like, after you, if they do that, after watching all the time and go back and rewatching the whole thing, you'll get a lot more true on the second pass, knowing some of the background stuff you'll learn later. And that's, that, that's called rewatchability, and you want that, you know. Um, what else can I say? I got links down below for more depth information. Um, always worth the read with the book. My name is Matt. This has been my review of Shogun 2024, Episode 6, The Ladies of the Willow World. Have a great weekend. Have a happy holiday. And have a nice day.